Welcome now to the third installment of Brad Presentation's already exciting afternoon. So we've explored stress and the cliff that is reality of confirmation. By the way, again, as an Anglican, I resonated deeply with that. Uh, I can stress it after. This is a confirmed by Austin. So thank you. Lots of food for thought. We continue uh, to move in dramatic ways. We're now moving to the question of suicide inside a family and the impact that has on their spiritual lives and, in fact, their lives. It's a very sobering way to spend our the last section of our uh, first day of the drive project. Okay. Susan Gamlin wants you to know two things about her. The most important thing to know about her is she's preparing for a ministry in the United Church of Canada. <laughs> The other thing she wants you to know, because you're never going to pick this up from her accent, is she's actually from Parsborough, Nova Scotia. <laughs> Somebody asked me if I was from Newfoundland. No! <laughs> like, were they from like Saskatchewan or something? Like, what's that? Okay. I thought, oh boy. <laughs> the next 45 minutes to 50 minutes, we're in Susan's hand. Susan, over to you. I'll take that. Yeah. Thank you, and greetings. The phone rang. It's one of those calls that you could never have imagined receiving just moments before. It was my daughter, Christine. She was a freshman at the time at the University of North Carolina. She lived about three hours away from me. She was sobbing uncontrollably. For several minutes, I could not make out what she was saying. She was the first person in our family to learn that her father had died in Miami. I really don't remember much of that conversation after that. Somehow or another, I must have managed to book a hotel for that night book some plane tickets for the following morning. Although no longer married, this was someone who had been an important part of my life. I had met him when I was 14, and I had known him for 25 years. I was in uncharted territory. All of a sudden, my kids and I became survivors of suicide. When I speak of survivors of suicide, I'm referring to the people who are left behind to grieve the loss of a loved one, or someone close to them who has died by suicide. Is anybody familiar with this ribbon at all? You are, Joni? A couple people? Okay. I wasn't aware that this was the ribbon for this cause, and uh, tried to get some for today, and. They didn't have them, so. But anyway, um, for a long time, uh, for research purposes, only family and friends took part in these studies. However, as time has gone on, we realized that there's a lot more than six people, which was the common uh, statistic that were supposedly affected by the suicide of someone. It's a lot more than six. Now it includes co-workers, classmates, clergy, and also a big class of healthcare professionals who are bereaved by suicide. <laughs> Regardless of whether one is religious or not, a death by suicide presents challenges for survivors that most other deaths can't equal. It's a perplexing kind of sudden death. It's very public. It can be stigmatized. And often, it involves violence. Religion as a source of meaning in people's lives has been displaced with the decline of the church. At one time, people would have set the story of their individual lives in the context of the larger story of our Christian faith. 
It was literally the framework for their thinking about life and death. While family and other relationships would have been important, they were not necessarily the most important aspect of human life. There was also the question of God's plan for the whole of creation, as well as your relationship with God, your discipleship, and your eternal destiny. This is no longer a reality in our post-Christian society. Relationships have center stage. But if meaning is derived more and more from relationships, we are more and more vulnerable when those relationships are threatened. Suicide is a threat not only to the individuals who die, but to those who are in relationship with them and are left behind. It's a threat, it's a loss to our social order. Everyone, every time someone dies by suicide, our, our world loses someone who is special to God. Today, mourners often gather at crematoriums or funeral homes rather than in sanctuaries. And it is not uncommon to learn that there will be no formal gathering of the family or friends at all. The research shows involvement in organized religions provides the opportunity to develop an extended support network in congregation members and in clergy, which has been shown to help in the prevention of suicide. Yet the church is the last place that many would consider to come for support of this type, for comfort, for care. Part of the reason for that is we have a lot of baggage. Mary T. Stimmons writes, the church has been instrumental in forging and perpetuating the stigma that haunts mental illness and suicide. This is not to be denied. But precisely because we have this history and Jesus calls us to healing ministries, there is no better venue than the church to promote a positive religious reframing of God's love. A reframing that seeks to promote reconciliation through demystifying attitudes concerning suicide, mental health, and even God's grace. At the very least, those who have lost a loved one to suicide deserve a theology of hope that is greater and more powerful than the hopelessness expressed in the suicide. Perhaps we can become the hospital that Augustine wrote about, where the damaged, wounded, and sinful are all mixed up with the more able-bodied. Where the church is holy not because its members are holy, although he put in there, although some are, <laughs> but because its head is holy. Jesus Christ is holy. Edwin S. Schneidman is a well-known name in the study of suicide. He helped to establish this field as an interdisciplinary field. He has since passed away in 2009, and in a book that he wrote, not his last book, but one of his last books, he wrote that what he, what he was going to write was going to be very controversial to his colleagues. He said that practically all the past and current studies, including his own, had missed the mark. He said one needs to examine the problem of suicide with an open mind and a fresh template. I strongly believe that it is what is sensibly required, he says, is a therapeutic agent, a person, who can reduce the individual's pain. 
he coined a term called psych ache. The two most important questions to ask are, where do you hurt? And how may I help you? I believe that this is a question that can be asked in the interest of suicide prevention as well as suicide bereavement. I hear Jesus ask those simple questions to many in the gospel stories. Many who were suffering from mental illness and stigmatization or their otherness. And he listened to their answers as a shepherd listens for the sheep. The single line of scripture that defined the Christian discussion of suicide for centuries is Exodus 20, 13. You shall not murder. In the fifth century, Augustine argued that suicide violated the sixth commandment. Later, Thomas Aquinas amplified this understanding of self-murder. Aquinas offered three reasons why suicide is a sin. They are, it contravenes the natural order whereby all living creatures seek to preserve their own life. It is destructive to the community of the person and acts against the best interest of the community. Life is given from God and only God may remove it. It is an act of rebellion against the sovereign will of God. Theologian Jürgen Moltmann believes we need to lose the expression of self-murder, but we do not need to consider suicide as normal. The goal of the commandment not to kill is to protect life. Like all killing, suicide is directed against life, and life in all circumstances is deserving of protection. Maltman suggests that suicide might be better understood as self-defense. When a depressed person takes their own life, they might be trying to avert unbearable psychological pressure. There is a lingering perception that the Christian church as a whole still condemns suicide as sin. Even the term commit suicide alludes to either a sinful or a criminal act. A simple way to begin to combat stigma is to say an individual died by suicide rather than committed suicide. The United Church of Canada views suicide as a tragedy, not a sin, not a failure of those who feel suicidal, not a cause for shame. My theological research is focused on the lived experience of four survivors of suicide. They were members of a faith community at the time of their loss. I wanted to explore the experience of suicide survivors through the lens of pastoral theology. <coughs> Robert Dykstra rem remarks that Jesus uses the shepherd image in his teaching to express God's concern for those who have gone astray. Pastoral theology for me is about having God's attitude of care and concern being sensitive to the complicated everyday needs of the human spirit. With my own ultimate theological thought and reflection being continually reworked. For me, this is a theology that by its very nature arises out of ordinary care and concern for people, rather than a pre-existing theology that is applied to care. My research has shown what I have witnessed in practice, that those who have lost a loved one are not interested in being engaged in the philosophical and theological debates about the ultimate questions of God and how God acts. They are more interested in the penultimate 
or the secondary questions of life. They're concerned with thinking and in some cases praying about the joys and sorrows and the sufferings and confusion surrounding their attempt to understand the challenging personal social elements of their own lives. Theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about the relationship of the penultimate and ultimate theological agendas. He said that when he was with someone who was suffering bereavement, especially if they were a Christian, he made the conscious decision to adopt a penultimate <coughs> attitude. He chose to remain silent as a sign that he shared in the bereaved person's helplessness in the face of the event. He wouldn't speak biblical words of comfort, which he said were known and available to him. He explained, the penultimate embraces the whole domain of Christian social life, and especially the whole range of Christian pastoral activity. Researcher John R. Jordan says, the ability, to be, the ability to be present with the pain of survivors without a rush to fix the problem is a crucial skill in working with traumatic bereavement. Because of my curiosity about and interest in bereavement and suicide, I invited members of the Christian faith community who had experienced the suicide of a loved one to participate in my theological research. Finding interviewees was more of a challenge than I imagined. I sought out participants from the United Church of Canada, the Anglican Diocese of Nova Scotia and PEI, and from the Presbyterian community. The first, and only four individuals who responded to the invitation to participate were interviewed for my study. And they were great. They were all members of the United Church of Canada at the time of the suicide, and they all remain so today. My research question. What is the experience of a member of a faith community who has lost a loved one to suicide? I conducted a qualitative study using the phenomenological method of research. An assumption of this method of inquiry is that there is a structure and an essence to shared experiences that can be narrated and understood. The participants were encouraged to give a full description of their experience, including their thoughts, feelings, images, and memories, along with a description of the situation in which the experience occurred. Researcher John R. Jordan again and his colleagues state that the hard-won wisdom acquired by those who are living with the loss of someone to suicide is likely to be more beneficial and more relevant to those seeking assistance than treatment approaches in the mental health field which emerge from the top down. Participants have been giving pseudonyms. They include Sophia, lost her former husband and father of her three adolescent children to suicide. Jackson, a father who lost his adult son. Emily, an adult who was an adolescent when her father died. And Lily, whose husband died by suicide. All of the participants in this study took part in a structured interview which was digitally recorded. They answered the same series of open-ended questions and various probing questions for clarification as needed. Each participant made themselves available by email for follow-up questions that emerged. All of these answers were then coded and analyzed. 
I think they were getting ready to block me when they saw me come in on email. <laughs> The themes that developed, uh, emerged, were essential in defining these four individual experiences of bereavement by suicide. Their experience would not have been able to be understood without these. My presentation will address three of these themes in some depth, mainly using the words of the participants. The themes are support for survivors, survivors and self-care. Survivors is theologically diverse. Support for survivors has been divided into two sub-themes, clergy response and congregational and community response. We'll talk about clergy response first. In 2007, the Duke Institute for Care at the end of life surveyed 917 faith leaders, of which clergy were 76% of the respondents. It showed that seven in 10 faith community leaders are comfortable providing support for grieving adults, but only three in 10 are comfortable supporting grieving teens and children. Half are comfortable providing grief support following accidental death. And only one quarter of the respondents are comfortable providing grief support following either violent death or death by suicide. My participants were asked to describe any contact that they had had with clergy or a chaplain following their loss. Sophia said, a new minister had just come in, and she did a really good job on the funeral. She didn't know who I was until the funeral. Later on, she did talk with me. I attended church quite regularly at that time. I really liked the minister. We had a Bible class going. She was a good person. Jackson was at a church that was just having the turnover of ministers. Speaking of the first minister, he said, she was just wonderful. She's an incredible minister. What more could you ask for from a minister? She was so impressive. Speaking now of the other minister, she was magnificent. <laughs> she was just so good. She asked us if she could state that he had taken his own life at the service, and we said, absolutely. Emily, who's our adolescent, says, just the regular Sundays when we would go to church, it was the normal thing to do. Could have been because I was 14 at the time, and adults really didn't know what to say. I don't remember the minister coming out. We weren't that type anyway. We just go to church. No one from the church comforted me. It was more awkward. It could have been because I was 14 at the time, and adults really didn't know what to say. Lily said, well, immediately a police chaplain came. It was nice to have someone there. And our minister was there very quickly. There was nothing at all wrong with the chaplain. I just didn't know him. I felt more comforted by the minister. She's a very loving, kind of, sort of, huggy person. She was excellent in touching base with me. Being involved in the church, I certainly had that regular contact. Overall, the UCC clergy responded to the survivors of suicide needs very well. Emily, an adolescent, had a different experience than the adults. Psychiatrist Harold Kapowitz writes, 
When children experience the sudden death of a parent, they go through what we call traumatic grieving. This kind of death is just not a painful thing to assimilate. It triggers an emotionally complicated or conflicted process. Emily was not supported in processing her feelings about the loss either at home, at school, or in the church. Research shows this is an indicator for how successfully children will recover. For Emily, it resulted in a later diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. Dr. Kapowitz reminds us, the most important thing to keep in mind is that the antidote to traumatic grief is honesty, loving support, and the continuation of the family in its strongest possible form. Congregational and community response. Let's look and see how the congregations and communities responded to my participants' needs following their loss. Sophia attended a Bible study with friends and neighbors. She had a hard time distinguishing between friends and others in the congregation. Neighbors and friends arrived to help her with her business. I think they thought because I seemed okay, I was fine. Jackson said, my relationship with fellow congregants is based on friendship, including the minister. The congregation behaved admirably. We found that people allowed us to talk about it. That did happen. People would talk about our son. Had it not been the response of the church to us from our son's death, we would have gone somewhere else. But the congregation was supported. Emily lived on a farm, and she said, our neighbors came and helped. They came one day and took all the crops off the field. Some neighbors were from my church and some were from other communities. And Lily said, I've been fortunate to have a circle of friends from different areas and different faith communities. We knew each other well. I felt truly loved and supported. And if I didn't have that and wasn't surrounded by the circle, the group, or whatever the word is, it probably would have been very different. I get emotional when I think how kind the people were, how they gave of their time and themselves over the months ahead, and so on, to support me. What do sur suicide survivors tell us they need? I don't think, Sophia says, I don't think I knew I had needs. It wasn't an issue. Jackson said, I'm an independent person. I wouldn't seek out anyone to comfort me. I don't know, I just don't feel the need. Emily said, as far as going to talk to somebody, there really wasn't anyone. I wasn't one to open up anyway. I didn't really have any close friends. I was worried, my sister was my closest friend, but I was worried that it would be hard on her. I focused what I needed to do. I started working in an accounting office at income tax time and did some things like that. I put the money in mom's bank account. I never told her. I'm sure she knew, but she never said anything, and I didn't either. Lily said, I don't think I ever sought out any care. To be truthful, I didn't go to them. They came to me. Despite the fact that self-care was not perceived as a concern by this, these participants, they recognized that others around them were suffering the traumatic loss, and they needed care. I wondered, was this a, a helpful distraction? Does it give meaning to their experience, or is it a burden? Hmm. Let's look at the participants' theologies and how they were affected by their loss. Sophia said that the experience had not affected her faith in God, because at that time she didn't have a lot of faith. I attended church but I didn't really get anything out of it. Jackson said, although he had attended church most of his life, he never really believed in God. The suicide had no effect on his faith. Emily said, all I could think of was, why did this happen? My faith in God was not affected, not at all. I just couldn't figure out why, and I knew there had to be a why. And Lily said, I suppose, in a sense, this event really strengthened my faith in God. The fact that my belief in a God to whom I could seek some solace, sharing, or whatever, 
was comforting to me at that time, as well as being able to pray for the same for others mourning, for others mourning my husband's death. Theological underpinnings were different for each participant, and it was difficult for them to go deep into their reflection on their own theology. In fact, they just touched the surface. The issue of theodicy came up for Sophia and Emily. Why would a benevolent and merciful God allow personal suffering and pain? It makes no sense. Theologically, the question can be reframed to ask not why we suffer, but who suffers with us? For Christians, the answer is the crucified one, Jesus the Nazarene. I would like to thank my four participants. Helen Sweet in the middle here is my consultant, and she is also a survivor of suicide. Dr. Jody Clark, and of course, we have to thank God. And, uh, and also, uh, this has really been rushed, and um, if you have any comments or would like some information, or I hope you'll stay tuned and, and look later on for the final, final report, because there's so much I just couldn't say that these folks said, and it was all really valuable stuff. Thank you. Susan, thank you so much. Okay. Over to you. Questions, comments, or thoughts? <laughs> Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. Um, I really appreciate the beginning how you um, you had clarified the terminology of yeah. survivor, and I know language is a, a big piece in how especially the church is coming to look at its understanding of suicide. And I wonder if language came up for any of the participants, such as how you say someone committed suicide, or yeah. an attempt, or a successful attempt. Yeah. And if they discussed that and how the church related to them. Uh, actually. Uh, my advisor had uh, told me years ago when I met her, when I became a student minister at Rockingham, I, I must have said that expression once, and she corrected me. And that was the beginning. I, we had a uh, workshop here, uh, a wonderful workshop with Barry Banks in November, and I noticed that they kept using the word commit suicide uh, in, that, uh, in that. But that, he was with the nurse, it was a more of a clue, Clinical, you see that in clinical, clinical things. Um, my folks pretty much knew that's what they were. They self-identified as a survivor of suicide. Uh, I, you know, I, I can't remember when it, when it came to me, but you, that's, if you read any kind of literature about it, any work on it, that's what you're gonna see. Sometime you'll see survivor of suicide loss. That's, an, I think, and, and they're probably trying to make it clearer because People that don't know might think that it has something to do with an attempt, and it does not. Thank you. Um, along that same um, line of questioning about language, I was struck by uh, your reference to Moldman, who said we move away from the um, the understanding of that that is self murder, but at the same time we can affirm that this is this is not normal or God's intention. That's right. Um, or in um, I, I believe you mentioned the United Church's change in language, or um, or maybe it wasn't a change, but adoption of language um, that it's it's, it's a tragedy and not a sin. That's right. And, I and that was a quote speak from them. To that. And the difference um, between okay. that, why it isn't, um, why, why the United Church does not consider it a sin. <laughs> We're liberal, uh, but anyway, I'll go. I won't, I'll go further than that. Uh, but I'm going to I'm going to flip back to Maltman first, because it's it's a it's a touchy thing. For instance, when you do have a funeral or a memorial service. It's while you want to acknowledge, uh, not everybody does, excuse me, but when people want to acknowledge 
uh, that, that this person has taken their own life. Uh, you have to be very careful not to glorify it. You don't want to stigmatize it, certainly, and you don't want to make it bad. But I've even seen in some research where they say, do not use the words that they are at peace. Uh, because you may have others that see that as that's the option to get peace. And now that we have so many more teenagers involved in suicide, uh, just placing that idea that, oh, that's peace in that. So I think, but I think it is really important to know it's not normal. This is not what we want. But that it's not, it's not a sin, and, and for me, it's more not so much that it's the, the sin is the uh, word that's the problem, is it's that the ramifications of what sin means to survivors. And, the, and for many, and even people who are not really churched, will bring up hell. <coughs> and there's a real concern for survivors in the literature they really wonder the final disposition of the soul of their loved one. Uh, so, I, the, you know, I'm, I wasn't there when they did it. I don't know the thinking behind it, but it is in line with, with the United Church's pastoral uh, approach uh, to our theology. And I, I suspect it had to do with that. Thank you. But I wasn't there, but yeah. Hi, Penny. You said that uh, everybody except Emily said that their minister was really great or yeah. marvelous. But did they actually say what the ministers did that, that was so great or so Sure. Great? Yes, they did. It, it really wasn't just made up. They really did. Uh, and I'll give you an example for one of them, uh, and maybe more, as I think here. Uh, one, one, of, uh, one of the people who died by suicide died in another province. The minister flew there and did not want to be reimbursed. Okay. Held a service in that province to which 400 some odd people came. That was when they, there was a turnover at that point. Came back, and the minister in the hometown church said, well, I think you need to have a service here too for everyone. So either one of them could have opted out on this, right? They went above and beyond, very caring and loving. And that service also had several hundred people at it. So that's an example of, you know, and they weren't a asked to go out of their way. They offered. So that's one thing. Um, I think another, another thing was, and I know Debbie Aiken's not here, and one of our big things at school was learning boundaries about she said to me, you can't be friends with your con congregation, you can befriend them. I'm, I have trouble with that. And all of these people, other than the adolescent who was basically ignored, it, it was the problem there, uh, have developed, they really care about their ministers. And in fact, two of them said that they were worried for their ministers because their ministers had lost someone close to them. So they actually became empathic, and that's what the, they did. They were not about their own self-care. They were about everybody else. So just, they were there. One of the comments was, just was there. At one, she arrived shortly after the event, and she sounded to me, these words weren't used, but she sounded to me like she was a traffic controller. You know, she was, she was trying to make it easy uh, for, for the loved one. So not any kind of, you know, a, a thing we try not to do, we try to help, but we really try not to harm. And in the community, there was some harm here, and there was some harm done to the adolescent. 
uh, at her school and, and other places. There wasn't even close to any harm done uh, to, to the adults. Yeah. Really impressive. Hi, it's good to see you. I know, it's amazing that I'm here watching you. Yeah, it's amazing because uh, you're going, what year is this? Is she still here? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I know. As <laughs> someone who's now done uh, some funerals yes. around suicide, yeah. you know if any of the participants talked about their feelings or their attitudes that they may have experienced when their loved one had suicide affect them? Like, what at the funeral, you mean? At the funeral, yeah. the process, do they speak yeah. all their own emotional yes. feelings? Yes, yes. We were talking about how the clergy responded. Yes. What was their... Okay, response? yeah. No, they absolutely did, all of them. Let's see. Uh, we'll start with Sophia. Uh, nothing, nothing about the service really touched her, okay? She really thought it was nice. They had, a, they had a good turnout in the community. She said that her former husband was really kind of a crazy kind of a dude, but that people liked him. They didn't understand him, she said, but they came. And seeing the people come was good. She had three teenage daughters, and they, they were a mess. So for her, the funeral was taking care of them. Uh, Jackson did not say anything specific about what touched him about, oh, yes, excuse me, excuse me, I had to email that one. Yes, I had to come back and say, was there anything that touched you on that? And it was actually having his grandchildren take part in the service. That was very meaningful for him. The clergy were not mentioned really in the service as far as, I think, uh, there was no complaints about them, but there was nothing. Um, Emily said, that her mother cried through the whole service. And her mother was pregnant at that time, too. Uh, and so uh, she said, though, that when she left the funeral, she said she doesn't really mean remember much, except she said at that point it became real for her. And unfortunately, she had witnessed the actual event. And, she, then, and that didn't even sink into her till she was there. She said that became real for her. The minister had no communication with her at all that day. And for Lily, Lily was busy taking care of other family members. And this seems to be a theme that is not just family members, excuse me, for the community, the congregation. There was a big responsibility to just make sure everybody was doing OK, because she remarked how they were just as devastated by her and she, as she was by by this event, and that um, she was worried for them. And uh, so, and she did make one other comment, and, and that, was there, that was also a very large funeral. And uh, that actually, as lovely as it was to have so many people there, they were in such grief too, that it actually was draining. It was hard. So I think what happened is, and the word shock is used through a lot of these other questions, which I wish I could have shared with you. Shock and, um, you know, the shock and the other word used over and over again was awful, okay? So it wasn't really comforting in the sense that I assumed in my own mind that it might be. It really wasn't. But then again, we don't know if they had, had, you know, if you take that and compare it to somebody who didn't have a ritual, how that would meant, what that would have mean. So it was, it, they were positive, they were tired, I think, you know, they were tired. It's, it's, a, it's, a tough, it's a very tough thing to go through. But thank you for that. And uh, I'm, can I ask you a real quick question? Were you comfortable? Were you comfortable doing uh, the funeral? Um, I was comfortable um, the second time around. Okay. I will say that. Yeah. The second time around, doing it was yeah. uh, easier than the first. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Susan. I'd like to return for a moment to the um, conceptualization of suicide as a tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, given the recent developments in terms of 
physician assisted suicide mm -hmm. and the legalization of that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's within the scope of your research at all to consider the theological implications or the, um, the required response of churches? No. Not at all. That, that nothing, there's nothing, I, nothing that I can think of similarly unless you want to just talk straight into sin and, and all that. And I, I have done no research on that. And I, you know how you can just imagine, I mean, when you make assumptions of something, my assumption is that it would be very different, that you, for one thing, you're not having the violence, the suddenness, the, you know, there's just so many different complicating elements in a suicide that is not natural. I mean, and I don't want to say natural, but not planned uh, by a group of people, you know, that with the physicians assisting and all. No, I, I don't have a thing to say on that. But we're, we're going to have to approach it and get educated about it, and I just don't know. And I'd, I'd say for one thing, I'm probably conflicted. I, and I mean, I'm not trying to go either. You know, I have a mother in her 11th year of Alzheimer's who would have loved to have some help. And that's, I feel like that's her right. Do I think it's morally and ethically and theologically right? That's a whole nother ball game. So I'm conflicted. Hi. Uh, just a quick question. Um, your participants, the interviewing people, mm -hmm. were there any things in their experience that we could take away from your interviews that would be useful to put in our toolbox to help rather than to harm people who experience suicide and well, actually, I did ask that question, uh, saying that, you know, as a new minister coming in, is there something that you can tell me? And basically, I was told to be there, to be there. No specific, you know, just to, to be there. But I did come up with some of my own, and one of, you know, implications that I felt for this, but I ran out of time. Uh, I talked too slow in the beginning, sorry about that. Uh, but. One thing that struck me was the inability to theologically reflect for each of these people, even with some probing about faith. And I can appreciate that from coming here to school and how hard theological reflection is to actually nail down what you say you believe. Because it's kind of scary because when you nail down what you believe, then you have to apply it to your life. And there's a lot that goes back and forth, as you know, in that, right? So I felt personally that uh, in the church that I'm going to go to, that I'm going to be teaching some theological reflection. Because God didn't really come into this a whole lot, or the expression of how God came into this was just really not there. Uh, and I have a tendency to think that, that you know, there's something deeper there, but it, uh, it's very hard to explain it if you don't know how to do it. So that was one thing. And I think one of the lessons, huge lesson, would be that children are people too. <laughs> they are people. They, if they are involved in a death of a family member, they shouldn't be brushed to the side. They should be talked to about death. And uh, I mean, there were some kids in the research that were only three when a parent had taken their life. And they ended up having some terrific uh, problems later on. Because unfortunately for children, uh, loss of one parent usually means that the other parent is emotionally unavailable because they're just trying to get by, you know, and trying to deal with it themselves. And it's, it's complicated. But one final question. Okay. Hey, Jenny. Uh, when did any of your participants identify shame as being one of the reigning emotions they felt mm -hmm. in regards to a loved one mm -hmm. who died by suicide? And if that's the case, how shame alters our mourning or our grief? Mm -hmm. How does it paralyze that or does it paralyze that? Okay. 
Only, only the adolescent, a Emily, had shame. Uh, but she still loved her dad. I mean, she didn't ever say that. And she still loved God. Uh, but she had an unfortunate incident happen at the school with a, with a teacher that <laughs> made her feel shamed. Um, and I, I think from the research you show that those things, if there's nobody to help and just talk and flesh it out a little bit, it has long-term effects. But that makes me think of stigma, too. And, uh, and I asked them about stigma, which I was very surprised because these were not recent suicides. So we're seeing a little bit of the lessening of stigma come on and just be replaced by inappropriate comments is, is, is our problem right now. Um, and uh, stigma was not a big part of this, which that, that was a surprise. Great. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have to stop. There are any more questions that could be posed. Um, thank you for the questions. Yeah, well, thank you for your response. <laughs>